Good morning. Uh, this is the um, interactive poster, poster sessions uh, for Life Finds a Way from the Undergraduate Research Symposium at the University of Oregon um, in May uh, 26, 2021. So um, I'm Barbara Jenkins. I'm uh, the coordinator of the library's um, outreach and um, research programs and also the psychology librarian. And my colleague, Leslie Coonrod is our second moderator for today. So we look forward to our five sessions. And each of these is a poster session where um, one or more presenters will be sharing their poster um, and uh, telling us about their research. We're really looking forward to it. So we'll get started uh, right away. Um, those of you who are attending, uh, if you do have a question, you can put it in the Q&A um, at the bottom of the screen and uh, we'll open for more uh, questions at the end, but we will have the opportunity for a few after each session. So we're going to open with um, our um, presenters that are uh, for Shannon um, Forsberg, Delaney Fossum, and Cameron, Cameron Bagans for the environmental analysis of trail development at Thurston Hills Natural Area. Okay, it's all yours. Hello, our project is environmental analysis of trail development at Thurston Hills Natural Area. The Lamoline Parks and Recreation District has a 20-year management plan for this area that calls for a baseline monitoring tool that will be used to evaluate how development impacts vegetation, wildlife, and hydrology. We used a wildlife camera and bird, plant, and slope surveys to conduct our research. We mapped native and invasive plants along the undeveloped trails and used GIS to determine which areas were ecologically sensitive. Using this information, we gave feedback to Willamaline on suggested improvements on trail design. This research will advance Willamaline's management goals for Thurston Hills Natural Area. The Thurston Hills Natural Area is located in Springfield, Oregon and covers 665 acres of land that offers a diversity of landscapes. The site was purchased by the Willamaline Parks and Recreation District back in 2006 when the previous owners decided to sell. This area has habitats that are rare to see in the Willamette Valley, namely prairies, grasslands, woodlands, and oak savannas. Willamaline wishes to preserve these target habitats while also creating a new system of trails that will encompass about 14.5 miles of trail for the surrounding communities to enjoy nature at. However, trails and human traffic can have many adverse impacts to conservation goals. Careful consideration of how wildlife, invasive species spread, and habitat conservation will be impacted is required. For these reasons, establishing baseline conditions and monitoring protocols was important, was important for our group to accomplish for Olamaline to be able to track positive and negative impacts over time. For our methodology, we conducted several baseline surveys within the site. Plant surveys were conducted along each trail with a focus on showy native flowers as well as prominent invasive species in the area. Each occurrence, for each occurrence, the species, for each occurrence, the species, the number of individuals in the population um, was estimated along with the area and density of the population. Slope was also recorded along each trail uh, for each segment of observable continuous grade. At each change in grade, observers would point clinometers from eye level to eye level from the beginning to the end of the segment and percent slope was recorded. Wildlife camera locations were determined based on animal tracks, stream locations, game trails, and probable grazing locations. Cameras were moved every two to three weeks to cover all the trails within the sites. Baseline photo point monitoring was done to track erosion and vegetation changes with the introduction of the trails. Camera points were identified as areas of potential erosion, social trails, or changes in the vegetation. GPS points were recorded and baseline photos were taken to be compared with future data collection. Lastly, we did bird point counts and they were conducted during peak breeding season and peak active hours for the migratory and native birds within the site. Observers stood at fixed points for five minutes and recorded each unique sighting or bird call they identified within a 50 meter radius of each point. 
Counts were taken in varying ecosystem types to ensure the most abundant data. Using our slope data, we determined which parts of the trails would be most susceptible to erosion and where this could be avoided by installing barriers such as culverts. And our first graph depicts the percent slopes of trails one and five at CH and A. Using our plant survey data, we mapped the parts of the trail containing sensitive nat native species and aggressive invasive species. This will inform Willamaline of where attractive native species are located along the trail and where invasives will need to be managed. And our first map is of points along trails four and five that contain native and invasive plant species. Our photo point data will be used by Willamaline to view changes to the trails over time. This will help inform them of where, when and where social trails, dog activity, and invasive species are negatively impacting trails. And our second map on the right is of the photo points we took along trail one, and the inset is an example of one of these photo points. Conducting bird point counts and implementing wildlife cameras informed us of the bird and large mammal species in Thurston Hills Natural Area that may be negatively affected by trail development and may also attract visitors to the site. The result of our research will be a dynamic monitoring tool, which Lamelain Parks and Recreation District will use to ensure the long-term sustainability of trail development at Thurston Hills Natural Area. In conclusion, some of the limitations we faced were having a limited amount of time in the field, a short window to collect wildflower data, and not being able to fully collect data on Trail 4 because of safety concerns. However, we found that once the trails are developed, the potential for social trails and humans to act as vectors for invasive plant species will increase substantially. We hope that the protocols and baseline conditions we designed will allow Willamaline to improve the trail design and protect the target habitats at the Thurston Hills Natural Area. Thank you all. That was excellent. Um, and uh, really interesting because it's a, a local uh, issue. So um, are there any questions in the uh, Q&A, Leslie? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Yes, we just had our, um, our first question come up. Um, so what are the recommendations you suggest for avoiding the social trails from forming? And, and a second question, what is the need for preserving prairie habitat, habitat in the Willamaline Valley? I can go ahead and answer the first part of that. Um, a main uh, thing we were looking at for social trails was the grade of the slope. Um, and places where it is either too steep or really flat and kind of meandering, that's often where people will kind of cut through. Um, for example, I'm sure all of you guys have seen it switchbacks when people will jump through. Um, so we took note of places where it's likely that people might be doing that or it's possible to do that. Um, and that's where we set up a lot of photo points to see where it could be an issue. Great, thanks. Leslie, anything else? Um, yeah, and so then um, what is the need for preserving prairie habitat in the Willamaline Valley? Um, I can take that one. Um, the re percent remaining um, prairie habitat in the Willamette Valley is less than 1% of the original range. Um, and these prairie habitats um, represent um, a huge opportunity for diverse wildflower species, bird species, um, and other species as well. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why we're looking at wildflowers, in particular in prairie habitat, and trying to preserve the last remaining um, generally um, uh, good habitat that's left. Okay, excellent. And then we do have one raised hand. Um, I'm going to allow, um, I apologize for the name pronunciation, Alexana, if you want to um, ask your question. I think you can unmute yourself now. No? Okay. Oh. Sorry, my Zooms. Uh, um, what animal species did you find on your camera traps? We were not super successful with the camera traps. We ended up catching mostly deer and a surprising amount of people. <laughs> Even though they were on mostly game trails, people are very curious animals. So uh, we were hoping to catch some elk, but it was mostly just deer. Okay, thank you all. And I do wanna note that um, the uh, faculty mentor here is Peg Boulay, 
and uh, many kudos to her as well. So thank you all uh, for an excellent presentation. So we are uh, moving to our second uh, poster presentation um, by Eleanor. Um, Eleanor Frohlich, um is talking to us about a very um, unusual uh, juvenile jaw from the John Day Formation of Oregon. I'm looking forward to it, Eleanor. You can go ahead, please. Sorry, how to get everything set up. It always takes a little bit longer than you expect it to. Uh, so for the Earth 434, 534 vertebrate paleontology class, we are tasked with identifying a specimen as a, our term project. And I got this little guy. This is Joda 2942 from the John Day Formation. And it is a juvenile um, apelodontid and family apelodontidae only has one extant member, and that's the mountain beaver. Uh, they don't really look like beavers. So I got this little guy and was trying to figure out what it was. Uh, and so I did this uh, by figuring out what exactly I had. And what Joda 2942 is, is a um, uh, left uh, mandibular fragment that's approximately this on the critter, but it's only about 1.2 centimeters long. Um, and Joda 2942 has a partial incisor, that's that honey colored stripe on the bottom left of the middle photo, as well as a deciduous or baby tooth, uh, premolar four, and then adult one, molar one, and molar two. And I quickly figured out this was a rodent because there were only really two things that have this uh, horizontal incisor, and that's uh, lagomorphs, uh, bunnies and rabbits, and rodents. Um, and this did not look like a bunny. Uh, so I was comparing it to a bunch of different um, rodents that are found in the John Day Formation at around the same time uh, that Joda 2942 is dated to, which is the Turtle Cove member, so approximately 26 to 24 million years ago in the Eurycorean. And I came up with two possibilities, Soelelodon predontia, that's a mouthful, which is on the right of results two, um, and then Rudiomys magrui, which is the very, very busted up tooth, uh, set of teeth on the left of results two. In the center of results two is a diagram of the tooth morphology of Joda 2942. So this whole project was me looking at teeny tiny teeth and figuring out what it was and how it compared. And if you compare Joda 2942 to Suelelodon predontia, just morphologically, they look fairly similar. Uh, not wonderful, not horrible, uh, but there are some really stark differences in the um, uh, uh, faucetids and the inflections, the little pits in the teeth. Um, and then when we compare it to Rudiomys mugrui, they fit a lot better. And so I did some um, measurements using uh, Image J, which is a uh, open source software that you can measure pictures in. It's great. Uh, and Joda 2942 doesn't is not, in fact, Soelelodon predontia because Soelelodon predontia has very square teeth, and Joda 2942 has very rectangular teeth. And so I named uh, Joda 2942 as Rudiomys and this is really significant because that very horrible photo on the left is the only figured Rudiomys magrui out there. Uh, there are some other Rudiomys magrui that have been identified, but this is the only one that's been figured. And it is very fragmentary. It's not well preserved. It's very hard to tell what's happening. And Jodaf 2942, as I said earlier, is very, very young. It has this deciduous tooth, um, meaning that we have an individual that has practically unworn morphology, and these teeth are gorgeous. And so we're uh, potentially with Joda 2942, we may be able to use it as a better comparison to what Rudiomys magrui teeth morphology is versus uh, UCMP 105122, which is the type specimen. 
Additionally, uh, that's, oh, why? Um, that specimen uh, is, um, does not have a P4, and while the Jota 2942 has a deciduous P4, um, it's something. It may not be perfect, but it's something. And in the future, we're hoping to uh, process the data from the CT scan of Jota 2942 to see if we can tell what that unworn um, adult P4 looked like. And that's what I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's definitely a, a, a trip down a long ago, uh, what happened long ago. So um, I am looking to see if there are any um, Q&A in the available, Leslie? I don't see any. I actually have a question. Um, this, this is very out of my wheelhouse. I'm just curious. So you've decided that it's a member of this particular um, I think species is the level you identified it at. How confident are you in that level of identification? Uh, fairly. Um, it was actually originally identified as Suelolidon prodontia by both me and somebody who has a PhD. Uh, and my mentor, uh, Sam Hopkins, uh, sat me down and went, let's look at this again. Take a look at this one in specific. And I sat down and went, oh no, it's, it's this other thing. So, uh, we, technically, it's a fairly uh, controversial um, diagnosis, but um, it's, it, I, we're pretty confident that it is, in fact, at least genus, genus Rudiomys, if not Rudiomys megrui. Very excellent. I just imagine it's, it, I imagine it's difficult to identify from such a small portion. Um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, um, yeah, we have a question from our uh, panelist, Delaney. Yeah, hi. Um, so I know with John Day fossil beds, there can be really well intact entire like ecosystems. I was wondering if you were able to gain any clues or anything from fossils that were found in the similar area, or if you just had the one isolated fossil to work with. So currently, I only have the one isolated fragment because uh, this is actually a specimen on loan from John Day. It's, it's at the University of Oregon currently, but it is from John Day. And I have no access to any of their records at the moment. Uh, so it's very possible we could use it as identification, but uh, I don't have those records <laughs> right now. And it's, um, from what I understand, the locality, uh, what I've been given is just north of Dayville, it's a Turtle Cove member. And the Turtle Cove member is, you know, three, four million years old. It's a decent chunk. So there's, we could potentially say some things about it. I can't. <laughs> Eleanor, um, could you identify for some of the people who don't know John Day um, exactly where this is and, um, and, and what it is uh, just a little bit? Yeah, so the John Day uh, formation is actually, part of it is on the National Park, and there's some more of it that's on uh, Bureau of Land Management land. But it is a um, large, very spectacular, fairly uh, desertous uh, region in central Oregon, um, just past, uh, just east of Bend and down south a bit, um, that has some spectacular photos uh, this spectacular specimens coming out of. And um, we have records for 20 million years. It, it's a very long frame with beautiful specimens. Uh, we can kind of track how the ecology of the Pacific Northwest changed over a very long period of time. And we're very, very lucky to have it. Great, yes, fantastic place. Okay, thank you very much, Eleanor, appreciate it. And we are moving to our third poster um, presentation. This is by Natalie, Jay, and Joseph. Oh, I'm sorry, before we go to that next one, I do want to acknowledge Eleanor's uh, faculty mentor, uh, Samantha Hopkins, for all the work that she did with um, this class and with Eleanor. Um, and uh, so Natalie, Jay, and Joseph um, are speaking about the Hendricks Forest management plan and 
it's all yours. Alrighty, hi, I'm Natalie and I'm with my co-presenters Jay and Joe today. So as climate change continues to impact our ecosystems, there's been concern regarding the longevity and safety of Eugene's Hendrick Forest, Hendrick's Forest. For the past eight weeks, 13 students with the Environmental Leadership Program have been collecting data on the tree health of the forest. It's 58 acres and predominantly Douglas fir dominated. Data has included tree diameter, crown measurements, presence of fungi, wildlife use, beetle bowl holes, and mapping the location of the trees that we measure. So the map on the bottom left of our poster depicts the location of all large trees that we have measured, and these are units 21 through 34. A 2019, data, 2019 team has collected data on the other units, which we are compiling currently into the map to get a full assessment and this data will be used to inform the City of Eugene's Parks and Open Spaces next forest management plan for Hendricks Forest. And now we'll move on to Jay with our results. So the top figure is a topographic map of Hendricks Parks. It is the relative altitude versus climate impact. The bottom is a tan base, which is a warmer temperature with a higher climate impact and the top is purple with a higher elevation but a lower climate impact. So that can tell us which trees are more affected via which are not. The density and dieback is a graph that presents the average crown dieback and crown density in a given unit. These are all measured in percentages and it shows how healthy the tree is. The one on the bottom of that is the average live crown ratio, which is in every given management union, we've done 21 through 34. And they are to represent how healthy the tree is according to how much crown ratio they have. Because the more uh, flora and fauna a tree has, the more healthy it is. The one next to it is the DBH distribution which means it is the whole park in general. And this is uh, seen in clear trees. And this is averaging between 36 inches and 40 inches. And this helps us to determine how big the trees get and how healthy they are based off of what's happened during that time frame. I'm going to take it to Joe now with the method. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, so based on our data, uh, we can expect Hendricks Forest to persist as a Douglas fir dominant forest for the foreseeable future, but its characteristics are likely to be altered by climate change and insect damage. Uh, according to our data, most of the trees in the park are not at risk of uprooting or falling by wind, but they are at risk of damage by Douglas fir beetles. Uh, these beetles utilize uh, dead Douglas firs for reproduction. Um, and so it's recommended that if any Douglas fir trees die within the park, that they be destroyed. Uh, uh, the, uh, pr pr the recommendation is that they be uh, sawed or chipped to speed up decomposition and prevent beetles from using them for habitat. Um, and because fallen dead trees are central to the forest nutrient cycle, it's instead suggested that deciduous trees be felled uh, with an emphasis on non-native trees such as uh, sweet cherry. Uh, in general, we recommend that the forest canopy be allowed to open up to encourage a greater diversity of understory species, but that if a large gap occurs and tree planting is considered desirable, that alternative species of trees to uh, Douglas fir be selected, namely the grand fir, western hemlock, and Oregon white oak trees. And because uh, Hendricks Forest is relatively dense and contains a relatively high fuel load, it is at risk for a catastrophic wildfire event. And as such, it's recommended that if such an event were to occur, that all of the Douglas fir trees as much as possible be removed and an oak savanna habitat be restored, restored in its place. This is because oak savanna habitat is one of the most threatened ecosystems in Oregon. 
and is relatively resistant to drought and wildfire. And because such an uh, restoration effort is so intensive, uh, we recommend that more recent practices and establish a contingency plan um, in light of this event. And that is all I had, so thank you. Thank you, Natalie, Jay, and Joseph. Um, so this is another uh, local um, experience that uh, where you are helping the city of Eugene, it sounds like, um, the parks uh, to, to do some work. Um, can you just uh, tell everyone, if they're not familiar with Hendrix Park, where exactly it is um, locally and why so it's important? If you go up Agate Street, and you take a left in the neighborhood. It's near uh, Summit View. It's kind of on the outskirts of town near the university. It's not too far. If you're living in downtown, it's about seven to 10 minute drive, depending on where you're going. And why is it such an important place in Eugene? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, first and foremost, it's considered, it's uh, Eugene's oldest park. Yeah, it was established in 1909, I believe. Um, and so it has some of the oldest trees um, in Eugene from what we can tell. Um, and as we said, uh, um, it's at risk of wildfire damage in light of the holiday farm fire. And so as wildfire becomes more, um, common and more intense uh, it becomes necessary to kind of guard against those things. And because Hendricks Forest is like so close to town and there are so many residential spaces within the park perimeter, uh, <laughs> it, it presents a especially uh, dangerous risk. Thank you. Leslie, can you tell me if we have any um, questions in the Q&A? No Q and A questions right now. Any any audience members have questions about Hendrix Park or the or the um, the survey that was done? Not any. I have uh, I have another question for you. Um, what was what do you consider something that was unexpected or uh, particularly? Um, Kind of a, a not 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 really what you expected. Kind of surprising about the data or about the um, landscape that you were working with. Yeah, I can go ahead and answer what I feel. We were kind of surprised at how many trees had beetle bore holes, and that's specific to the Douglas fir. They tried pheromone tags to deter beetles in trees, but even trees with those tags had tons of holes. So we were quite shocked. It's We couldn't even make a graph with that because every tree had some holes in them. So that was quite shocking. There's also a lot of blackberry in the understory and the herbaceous layers. So that was difficult for us to transverse, but also crowding out native species and so we're there's obviously a battle with trying to restore that layer and how to go about it. Same thing with ivy. That was frustrating to see at the edges of the, the forest having private property ivy on it, we, but we can't get to it, yet it's encroaching on the forest. So um, can you say that the, um, the beetles that you're talking about, um, right, the, the, that are boring into the, the trees, is that due to a specific problem related to climate or temperature or something? I can do that. Um, so when we first started the protocol, the uh, beetles were actually coming into the trees because of the temperature and how they, uh, they like to feed off trees that are partially living and partially dying. It's kind of like their little nook, their home. So yeah, it has to do with climate change and uh, the trees dying and not reproducing correctly. So that's why there is tons and increase of the beetles. 
Great. Well, thank you for that. I have a question. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Leslie. Yeah. Um, just Natalie's comment about, you know, all these residential areas nearby that have like the ivy on their property, but that then is, you know, encroaching. Is there something that nearby um, property owners can do to sort of help this, this issue? Yeah, so I think it's just an effort of constant, edu constant education of the neighborhood areas and you get a lot of those residential people coming into the park to hike and they'll stop and ask what we're doing. And so we just have to help and inform any of those hikers and bring awareness to the issue. Other than that, it's pretty difficult to communicate the fact that they're invasive and they spread very quickly. So I think it'll just take more of an awareness campaign and there's um, friends of Hendrix, they, they come in and they also do removal efforts. And so just trying to partner with them more in the community. Well, thank you. Great, thank you very much. And um, we are moving to our uh, next poster session, which is Amelia Lawson. And she is going to be uh, showing us uh, her poster and speaking about the prehistoric mountain beaver identification from Eastern Oregon. Oh, uh, em Amelia, sorry, just before I go to that, I do want to acknowledge that um, the previous uh, poster session um, faculty mentors were Peg Boulay and Alex Rainier, and uh, appreciate all the work that they've done. Okay, uh, Amelia, uh, we are okay. ready for your presentation. Lovely, thank you. Just trying to get my screen chair up. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Amelia Lawson, a third year undergraduate here at the university, studying environmental science as a major and earth science and biology minors. For my research, I'm studying an apelodontid fossil from Eastern Oregon that dates roughly 30 to 26 million years old from the Turtle Cove member of the John Day Formation, similar to where Eleanor's was found. There are over 100 different species in the Apelodontid family, recognized today varying all in size and niches. For my fossil, it consists of a skull, which can be seen in figure three, a mandible, which can be seen in figure two, an auditory bulla, and postcrania, such as a femur and tibia. For the identification of my specimen, I used online databases such as FossilWorks and the marine, sorry, uh, and the paleobiology database, um, and throw across analysis of a plethora of scientific literature regarding the topic. As with most mammals, the identification of this specimen was carried out using the dental morphology. For most mammals, you can identify down to the species just on wear patterns, shape, and structure of the teeth. My research suggests that this specimen is of Haplomys neolopis, an extinct apelodontid species. This is the most intact and well-preserved Haplomys neolopis specimen found so far. When compared to other Aplodontids, Aplomys leolopis is exceptionally larger than other rodents in the family, suggesting that um, it had a different niche than a lot of other members of, this, of the family. Some of the next steps for my research include getting the specimen skull CT scanned, which will allow for the morphology below the specimen surface to be observed. Um, this will be able to tell us more about the environment that the specimen lived in at uh, the time that it was alive. And as for the auditory bulla that I met, met, mentioned earlier, um, doing CT scans of this will let us see the structures inside of there, and then we'll be able to know how good of hearing it had, which could indicate more about its niche. After that, we are hoping to pub publish a paper on the findings seen as though is the most well-preserved well specimen found for Alphabuse Leolophus. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Amanda Ping and Samantha Hopkins 
my mentors for providing the help needed to succeed. Thank you, Amanda, Amelia, appreciate it. Um, yes, the uh, interesting about how it was much larger than, uh, than the other ones. Um, Leslie, are there any questions in the Q&A? Not at this moment, no. Well, I have the, the question about um, a little bit more about um, its size and um, how, how that really, um, what, that, what kind of ecosystem was that, that it was able to get to be, as you say, larger? Um, was it substantially larger than anything else? Um, a little bit. Uh, the specimen or species that I thought that it was prior ended up actually being half the size in regards to molar proportions. Um, so it was at least double the size of that one, which was Proscurium relectus, um, another aplodontid species. Thanks. I have kind of a general question, if that's all right. Um, I know very little about paleontology. When you first, you know, get handed this specimen, I, I guess what's just your general approach to even starting down this path of identification? Yeah, um, so in the beginning, I was just using photos. The specimen is actually from uh, Berkeley down in California. So it didn't come in the mail until two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, so I had just been searching online databases, trying to find something that looked similar. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of process of elimination. Did you have kind of a like a, a, a kind of a guess to, to like an intuition or a suggestion that somebody had had maybe tried to identify it before? Or were you going kind of kind of blind? Yeah, um, my advisor, Samantha Hopkins, had said that she thought she knew what it was, but then um, was trying to see what I was going to think what it would be. So then I went through probably 10 different guesses of trying to guess what it was going to be, um, and then finally made it to half of these little bits. It was probably great to get it in the mail finally. Uh... <laughs> That's a good example of the challenges of uh, research during a pandemic, for sure. <laughs> okay, and I do want to acknowledge uh, Amelia's uh, faculty mentors, M Samantha Hopkins and Amanda Fang, uh, for all the work that they've done for you um, and the class during this time. Thank you very much, Amelia. Our last uh, presenters um, in this poster session um, are uh, Riley and Liam, um, who are going to be uh, speaking to us um, on the social cost of reproduction uh, to female lemur kata. Um, and um, it's all yours. It hasn't popped up for me yet, but can everybody else see it? Um, Liam, you're yet. coming in a little bit um, quiet. Can you raise up your um, a little bit? Oh, yeah. No, I hadn't unmuted myself yet. Are you able to see the um, the poster? Yes. Said no, yes. yes. Can everybody hear me OK? I know my speaker has been not very good. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit louder would be fine. Yeah. OK. Um, hi, I'm Riley Mail. And I'm Liam Stone. And we're a part of the Department of Anthropology and members of Dr. Francis White's Primate Osteology Lab. Um, today, we're going to be presenting on the social cost of reproduction to female lemur cata. We became interested in this topic after finding interaction data from Dr. White that included many infant individuals. After coming up with multiple different questions surrounding this data and speaking to Dr. Ann Myrtle Mulholland, we narrowed down our interest to this project. Prior research has shown that female lemur cata are dominant over males. This is likely due to the high cost of reproduction in a seasonal environment with low resources, and numerous studies on behavioral traits and birthing intervals support this. Because of this, we expect that females with infants could show different behavioral strategies than females without infants that reflect their higher reproductive-related costs. 
So our final question was, do females with infants and without infants show behavioral differences that are consistent with higher reproductive costs? Due to the previous research on this topic, we hypothesized that females with higher costs would engage in more aggressive and less affiliative behaviors. And to test this, we studied focal sampling taken from two groups at the Duke Lemur Center in North Carolina from 1996. Information regarding these groups is depicted in table one on our poster. We compared interactions involving females with offspring less than a year old at the time to females without infants for a total of five and four respectively. We calculated rates of aggressive and affiliative behaviors based on the observation time of 28.25 hours, then compiled affiliative behaviors such as playing and grooming and agonistic actions, including chasing and stealing food. We found that females with infants were involved in about three times the amount of aggressive interactions than those without. Furthermore, females without infants performed 3.3 times more affiliative behaviors than those who were caring for infants. The clear variation in these rates are reflected in figure one on our poster. These findings depict that reproductive status can influence social or behavioral strategies in Lemurcata. These results are consistent with the prediction that females with infants suffer higher costs than those without. This could certainly have implications regarding social hierarchies and may also play a role in determining reproductive success. Though these findings raise many questions about ontogeny and social interactions, we're most interested in studying the role that dominance plays in regard to these results in the future. Overall, infants play a unique role in the development of social bonds and influencing behavior. Studying this can allow us to better understand lemur cata interactions and how they compare to other primates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was quite a bit of uh, data that you, re you got from another um, group or organization, correct? That, that you were able to acquire. How were you able to acquire that kind of detailed data? Um, our faculty mentor, Frances White, uh, she actually worked at the Duke Lemur Center in North Carolina for a while, and so she did a lot of research there. Um, and she has a lot of data that she just hasn't really done anything with yet. Um, and so we have like Excel sheets on Excel sheets in our OneDrive of just data that hasn't really been looked at yet. Um, and being part of her osteology lab, she allows us access to that and lets us kind of look through and see what we want to do with it. And so this is what we chose. A great data set. Yeah, that's wonderful. Leslie, is there any, um, are there any questions in the q and I don't see any Q&A questions right now, but I have a, a question about kind of the data format themselves. You mentioned Excel spreadsheets on Excel spreadsheets. Um, are these interactions kind of like um, captured in those Excel spreadsheets? Um, I guess just like, what does the data kind of look like? I'm curious. Yeah, I can kind of uh, discuss that. So a lot of it is um, like focal data that say every five minutes or something, um, the researcher would just write down what the specific uh, individual they were looking at, what they were doing, um, how close they were to other individuals, um, if there was an infant nearby or something. And then from that, you know, we can take the behaviors such as, yeah, you know, like chasing someone away or kind of shouting at them versus grooming or playing with them to kind of sort out what their uh, intentions were. And then we kind of mapped uh, those behaviors onto interactions where lemur infants were or weren't uh, near their mothers to kind of get our graphs. And so then your, your pipeline, I guess, to kind of analyze these data are literally just reading all these things. It doesn't sound like there's a nice kind of systematic way to, to write a program or anything like that. It's finding, yeah, a lot of the short little uh, behavioral codes of, you know, what actually is playing or grooming. And then we pretty much just turn that into all ones and zeros to calculate different rates. Um, but yeah, you know, there's no really nice script of uh, the great story of what all the lemurs are doing with each other. It's just getting it from row by row of Excel data. But it's pretty interesting to see, you know, all the behaviors and social identities of each individual. That's amazing. My hat's off to the original collectors of those data. <laughs> Sounds intense. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A. Um, what are the few social costs that are specific to the lemur cata? Um, yeah, I can try to answer that one. Um, 
I know one of the big things that lemur cata faces is that they actually are only fertile for a few days out of the entire year. And so their breeding season is very short. Sometimes females can even only be fertile for one day, which is crazy. They need to make sure that they find really high quality mates in order to produce offspring that year. Another thing is they live in a really highly seasonal resource availability environment. And so that kind of reflects that breeding season. They're gonna be breeding in the time when the resources are higher. And so that's kind of what we, how we draw, drew this conclusion was um, they are gonna be more aggressive in order to protect their young because obviously because of these really high costs, they need to protect their young at all costs because it may be the only one they had for the entire year. Thank you. I, I've really, sorry, my, my brain is just exploding with questions now. <laughs> um, I wonder, is there anything to be learned from this um, really big uh, jump in the affiliative um, interactions of the females without infants? Is there, are, are there conclusions that could be drawn from that? You know, that's a really good question and one that I don't think we, we've discussed that much. We've more been focused on, you know, the females with infants and what they're doing to, uh, to protect that investment. Um, I, you know, I, I suppose something could be said about um, trying to create relationships and social bonds for later years, um, because a lot of times, you know, in, I believe uh, lemur cattle like will have some years that like they do try and reproduce and then off years where they actually don't uh, invest in an offspring. Um, so potentially like setting themselves up for success in later years, but it's definitely worth uh, looking into because it is a pretty stark difference. Yeah, I could kind of add on to that too. I know another thing that we might see are high levels of infant attraction from other females. So those that don't have infants may be wanting to kind of get in on the infants and parent for them, help the females and see what this new little thing is all about really. As a parent to a young child, that would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Riley and Liam, for your, um, for your discussion and for your great uh, analysis of some very complex data. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge um, your faculty mentors, Francis White and Colin Brand, for all their um, getting you access to the data and all their assistance in your project. I wanted to add on to that too really quick. Alex Hickmott was also one of them. It just only allowed me to put two, but I want to shout her out too because she was so much help. <laughs> Great, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, having a support network, especially uh, doing research during a pandemic, that is absolutely critical. Well, that concludes our poster uh, presentations for today. And it's been very exciting to have um, everyone share their uh, research journeys and we do have some time for um, further question and answers. Um, so if you'd all just stay um, on and we'll see if there are further things in the Q um, and A through Leslie um, and also share some of our own questions. So other presenters, if you have questions, please um, either note them in the Q and A or raise your hand so Leslie can um, be aware of your question. Yes, and I, I would welcome all of our, our panels today to turn their videos back on if they're if they're comfortable with that so we can see you all again. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a kind of a question to the whole panel. Um, retrospectively, now that you're, I, so I know some of you may be continuing projects beyond, but now that you're at kind of a, a pause point, we'll call it. Um, reflecting back, is there any approach you might have taken differently now that you're older and wiser. Yeah, Jay. I mean, with approaches, I think communication mm -hmm. was key in our group. And it's something that uh, I think I would work on in the future. We got a lot better throughout the course. Um, however, I do know that it would be something that I would try to do with my future jobs, especially in environmental work, because that's very significant and important. Jay, when you say communication, um, can you identify one or two types of things that you're particularly referring to? Um, 
not field work in particular, but when we're in the backstage, when we're trying to do things off of the field work, that was when it was a lot more harder and a lot more uh, complicated to figure out because one group would be doing one thing and then one group would be doing another and then there'd be conflict and it was hard to figure out who was doing what. Right. And made probably worse by being isolated from each other. Physically. Yeah, yeah, not being able to be uh, social distancing in person outside of the field. Yeah, that was a very big drawback. <laughs> but I think uh, Jay has identified uh, something that a lot of people deal with in research because increasingly in the sciences and social sciences and even in the humanities, um, you're doing research with people um, who are not uh, coexisting in a real um, close to you. And so you're often doing things with people internationally or across the country. And so uh, those kind of um, remote communication skills um, do take a lot of work. So that's great observation. Others that want to address uh, Leslie's, uh, how would you do it differently kind of question? I think it's a really good reflective question. Riley? Um. I think a big thing for us was maybe just starting earlier, which is crazy because we started so early, we thought, and then as we were going through the data, we were like, wow, this is going to take longer than we expected. Um, but that also may be unique to us because our data was a little bit difficult to code compared to other data sets. Um, but yeah, we were just, we would look at it and be like, oh, we need more data. We need individual data. We need to know who is infants. We need to know who's females and things like that. Um, but Frances White was definitely able to help us a lot with that because she was actually there and we weren't. And so we don't necessarily know who these individuals were, but yeah, definitely starting as soon as possible would be a huge thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that you experienced something that more and more people are going to be experiencing in, in research where other people have collected the data sets and they're large. And there's this sort of sense when you do your own field, when you do your own research, that you are sort of intimate with it, um, that you've lived that experience, you, you physically lived it. Um, but to come to it as just data without having physically been there collecting it um, is really a different kind of thing. Did you, um, did you really sort of sometimes wonder what were they thinking when they were doing the research on site? <laughs> Funny enough, sometimes, yeah. Um, we, a lot of times we were thinking like, these codes that describe the behavior, they, they really should have been a master list that explained every code and what the behavior they were trying to code for was because sometimes it would say something like LEV and we were like, okay, does that mean leave? And if so, is that aggressive or is it affiliative? Like we didn't really know. And so we wish that there was some sort of like list to kind of explain to other people what they were trying to go for when they were creating these little like acronyms. Right, they needed to give you a code book, right? Yes. <laughs> for sure. Other people wanted to respond to that? I saw Joseph's hand up next. Yeah, so piggybacking off of both Jay and Riley's point, um, we since we were basically picking up where the 2019 team left off, uh, the way that they structured their data and the way that we were actually uh, putting our data together has, has now made it like uh, an extra task to try and make the two data sets fit together. And so I feel like if, uh, so we're going to be wrapping up uh, this project. We'll be the last team here at Hendricks Park, so it doesn't exactly apply. But if we had another team going forward, uh, being able to communicate to them, like, for the future that, like, okay, this is the protocol we followed for uh, our data set. So even if you, you decide to do it differently, this is how we did it. So you can, like, plan ahead because... Uh, we didn't get the data set for 2019 until I think, you know, a few weeks ago, we'd, we'd already started our data set. Um, and so we'd already had uh, everything set up in our own little way. And now it's a uh, extra step to, to make them fit. So communication and good data management. <laughs> right. 
I think all scientists need to hear that. Good data management, reproducible right. science, communication, all very important points. <laughs> That's right. It, it, is, um, it is increasingly a major area. And just um, I just wanted to point out for our people with this uh, presentation that the library has actually started a data, data services department to address all these things um, that undergraduates and graduates and faculty have to deal with with this, this huge amount of data and how you slice and dice it and how what the ethics are and how you uh, put it together a code book, all those kinds of things. So uh, it's really an essential piece of it. I think Shannon was next, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, one of the challenges that um, we faced was we had less time than other ELP groups. Normally it would be eight hours in the field, but we only had five hours a week. Um, and so it definitely felt rushed a lot of the times, like, are we going to be able to get everything done? And we would have to split into groups within our group. So like two or three people doing one thing while two or three people are doing another thing. Um, and that definitely made it harder for us to then compile our data and then um, put it all together and communicate it. Um, and we had a really big challenge with, with one of our trails, which, um, had gotten pretty overgrown and wasn't like really clear where it was located. And if we'd had more time, we probably would have been able to um, determine the actual location of the beginning of the trail and we wouldn't have had to go back as much. Um, and so just having more time would have made us feel less rushed and would have helped us to communicate more. Great, yeah, that is so critical, absolutely. Um, does anyone want to address that question? I have another question for the group, but there's no Q&A. No Q&A right now. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I see so that. My, uh, my question is, um, did this research that you were doing um, suggest something to you in terms of your own path of whether it be um, further research that you're interested in, a career, a decision like, I don't want to do this kind of research in my future. <laughs> um, or did it spark something in you to pursue something specific? I think Natalie, I see you. Yeah, I was going to say one thing about the previous question, but I can also attest to this question. Um, for the previous question, technology was both a blessing and a curse because we had to split up across the entire park and we had to communicate via phone sometimes to call each other and say, is this what you're seeing? Okay, this is what this tree looks like. Here's what I'm doing. And we also had GPS units, which helped us to find trees. And sometimes there were trees that didn't exist for some reason. And so it was, it was nice to have some technology and other times it was very difficult to navigate using it. And for your question, Barbara, I found that I, I do like working in the field. I've done that previously and so just kind of confirmed that maybe once or twice a week is fine, but I don't think I could be out eight hours a day romping up and down in blackberry fields. So I, I did find that I like working with teams and I like being kind of organizing. So I will carry that forward with whatever job I do next. Um. Leslie, you probably have been watching who's next. Can you identify who's speaking? I think it was Amelia next. I apologize. A lot of people raised their hand kind of at the same time. Um, yeah, so in response to your question, I feel like this research opportunity has really helped me develop as like a student. Um, and I really have liked the systematic methods of being able to go through and be like, no, it's not the species. It's not this one. It's it, it did get kind of sad and depressing at some points <laughs> being told no. Um, but it's nice being able to rule out along the way. And then once you finally figure it out, it's so rewarding. And I think it was uh, Eleanor and then Shannon. So I actually did a paleontology uh, project for the undergraduate research fair last year. Um, and I found that I like this one a lot more. And part of that is because last year it was very much a scramble of, ah, 
we're all in a pandemic now. And so I did a uh, very long convoluted uh, project pulling data from a lot of different online sources, not all of them great, and putting it together and seeing like what we could tell about um, camel body size and hips and auntie in the Pacific Northwest. Um, because camel uh, camels evolved in North America, fun fact. <laughs> um, and, and this was actually, you know, a lot. I came out of that one kind of hating what I was doing and being like, oh yeah, you know, I really like camels. I'm going to keep going with this, but damn did that project. Mm. And, and this one was a lot more fun and I enjoyed it a lot more because as Amelia said, you know, you get this thing and it's like, what is it? And there is an answer. It's just, you know, it might be something new or it might be something unfigured, but not new. Um, and it, it's really fun. And it's actually opened a lot of new doors because I'm actually uh, continuing this project for um, a different presentation later on in the fall. And I think Amelia is also continuing for the same presentation. Um, it's, it's just another form of the same thing and it's a lot more fun. And you get the experience presenting it too, which, which will um, help out as you go forward as well. Great, thank you. Shannon? Yeah, um, this project really confirmed me that I love field work um, and it actually made me realize how interested I am in plants. Previously, I'd been more interested in um, animals, um, specifically large mammals, but I really love plants now. I love identifying and I love um, thinking about native and invasive species. Um, kind of similar to Natalie though, I'm realizing I'm not gonna be doing this for eight hours a day field work. Um, which is a little disappointing because like a lot of jobs in this field want you to be like hike 10 miles for 10 hours a day, five to six days a week. Um, and so it's a little scary to think about like, how am I going to find field work that's like balanced with laboratory work? Um, but it definitely like confirms that I'm studying what I've been interested in this whole time. Great, thank you. Lots of reflection, right? Uh, I think I saw Joseph and then Jay. Yeah, um, I, I'm pretty much in agreement with Shannon there that um, this kind of st sparked uh, interest in plants for me too. Um, and then it also was really interesting because it, it required basically all of the knowledge that I've acquired uh, in undergrad as an environmental science major, right? So we were doing uh, you know, data management, uh, the write-ups, um, GIS, uh, plant identification, all, all the good stuff. And so learning not only how to do any one thing, but actually bounce between those uh, aspects and then pull it all together at the end, that was really interesting. And I'm of the same mind that like, theoretically it's, it would sound cool to do like, nothing but field work, but I don't know that my body would be able <laughs> to handle it um, after after so many weeks of that, um, and after so many years in that field, for sure. Uh, so I think, you know, having, having a field component, but then bringing that data back to actually work with it and see like what we determined, um, what could be determined from it is, is a, a better mix for me. Right, right. Thank you. Um, Jay? Vicky, back off of Joseph. I actually did an internship in Lincoln City. That's where I am right now. Um, basically, it was field work 10 hours a day for five days a week. And, you know, just affiliating myself with uh, field work again, it was, it was kind of uh, aggressive. And so I wouldn't do it in... Uh, steeper grounds, but I would definitely do it on flatter. Um, <laughs> what I've learned is I like lab work a lot more. And I was in paleoecology with Eleanor and uh, Amelia actually in winter term. And I know how hard it is to be in a lab, but I rather do uh, lab work than be out in the field. Cause I think it's more interesting 
yet, but if you can combine the both, because I've been wanting to work with marine biologists to solve pollution problems, if you could combine the both, that would be something I would totally do. Great, thank you. Does anybody else want to share? Um, I'm not able to see all of you on my screen at the same time. Um, Leslie, do you see anybody else? I see uh, no hands or questions right now. Okay. Well, I really appreciate all of you reflecting so much about your experience because doing the experience is one thing, but reflecting on it is um, you know, set another set of skills. And I think one of the things that's really um, wonderful about what you've been doing is each experience you have in, of this kind that tells you a little bit more about your path and, and who you are and how you want to, um, you know, what you want to do in your career and what's important to you. And I always thought it was great to, to know what you don't want to do because that gives you a lot of insight into what you want to do for your career. So um, kudos to you to always um, to have those reflections and to keep them in mind as you, uh, as you go forward um, with your next, those combination jobs that are just ideal, sound like um, a lot of where a lot of you are heading, but you also have developed some substantial communication skills and those will stand you in great stead, no matter what kind of career you pursue or academe or non-academe. So um, kudos to you all. I think this was just a really exciting and fun um, session and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, as you know, your posters are up on YouTube in the Undergraduate Research Award um, YouTube channel, um, part of the U of O's YouTube channel. And also this presentation is going to be up there as well. So if you had anybody in your family or friends that didn't get the chance to see it, it will be up there for you. Probably takes a little bit of time to get it actually posted, uh, but it should be up there in the next uh, day or so. So um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And Leslie, I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Amazing posters all around. It's always so much fun to hear about the wide variety of work that's being done here at the University of Oregon. I love coming to the Undergraduate Research Symposium because of that, because you get to hear about, you know, walking through Hendricks Park and looking at the trees and you get to hear about identifying these tiny pieces of bone, which just still blows my mind to um, admire the people digging through these spreadsheets <laughs> and taking, you know, the data to the next step. Um, that's something we do a lot in my field of bioinformatics. We have just piles and piles and piles of data sitting and waiting for someone to come along with the dedication to process them. So kudos to all of you, uh, no matter what your project was and the progress that you were able to make, you were all amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, really super appreciate it. Um, just a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you all. And thank all your faculty mentors and your co-authors as well. So uh, if there's anything else, Leslie, before we sign off? I, I think, yeah, I think we've covered everything unless any of our participants has anything else they want to add. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.